Should you move to Mozambique? It depends on what you're looking for. What are you looking for? Are you interested in living off grid? Are you interested in uh, agriculture? Uh, are you interested in technology? Because they could use a lot of that. It really depends on what you, what are your top five non-negotiables and what does that country have to offer? If you are looking to escape an apartheid system, Mozambique probably will not be for you. Welcome to Blacks into Africa. I'm Tadre Delora Mornier, a California native living my best life in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for coming along for the ride. I hope that you are informed, entertained, and inspired to Blacks it to Africa. Hello, my good people, and welcome back. I'm so glad to see you, and I'm so glad that you're here. Today's topic is, should you move to Mozambique? Should you black sit to Mozambique? So, per usual, per usual, I have got my notes here, just so that I can stay on track. So if you see me glancing off to the side, that's what I'm looking at. I've got this delicious passion, lime, honey, green tea, that I made myself, oh my God. It's so delicious. And once again, it's another gloomy overcast day in Nairobi. I swear y'all, I am moving to the coast, <laughs> I'm moving. Listen, Nairobi has been good to me. However, I believe that I have gotten to the point where I'm really no longer availing myself of the benefits of a metropolis. Like I love my book clubs, I love the Pan-African bookstores, I love the galleries, all the special events that happen here, but I'm just feeling more like I want sunshine 24 seven. I want warm, salty Indian Ocean vibes, clear blue, turquoise water vibes, fresh fruits. I'm a veggie now, but I know when I move to the coast, I'm gonna be eating more seafood. Um, I would like that to be my daily rather than that being the exception so i want that to be my daily and then just coming to the city to get my city fix every now and again because this right here i know y'all said oh it's gonna be over in september and technically i think it's only like three months right it's three months of this and then you have like maybe the short rains it's a couple of months but still auntie is tired so i will be moving to the coast um if not by the end of this year early next year just to give you a little update, um, before I get into my experiences in Mozambique, let me just state the facts. So I was in Mozambique from July 13th through August 2nd, 2023, so about three weeks. And I stayed in Maputo, which is the capital city, for about seven days. Really enjoyed my time there. I was in Topu Beach for about five days and Bilanculos for about nine days. Mozambique got their independence from Portugal on June 25th, 1975. Now, just to give you some context, I was born in 1973. Kenya received its independence from Britain in 1963. I feel like I'm using the wrong language here. Received, got, fought, won. Maybe that's the better word, won their independence. However, the Mozambicans, indigenous Mozambicans, received one, their independence from Portugal in 1975, ending 470 years of Portuguese rule. Ooh. Now, most African nations received their independence or won their independence in the early 1960s. These Portuguese nations, Angola, Sao Tome, I think also Guinea-Bissau might be included in that, A, 70s. In fact, in Sao Tome, slavery still existed. Cape Verde, um, 1975 or 74, thereabouts. So... 
that's a good 15 or so years after all these other African nations won their independence from their colonizers. Now, let me circle back to the United States of America. Now, we received our freedom. We were emancipated as African peoples from the shackles of slavery in the late 1860s. However, how am so ever, there were still people that were enslaved in the United States of America in the 70s. I read about this and I was shocked. Like we celebrate Juneteenth and, you know, it was after uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. However, there were still African Americans who were enslaved in the United States in the 70s. And there was an older woman who was interviewed and she says, you know, you guys have to understand that these plantations are ginormous. They stretch for miles and miles and miles. You're never allowed to leave the plantation. So how would you know that you were free unless somebody told you? So I just wanted to make that connection before we start judging, okay? Now, I wanna talk about the household literacy rate in Mozambique. Because I was going to wait till later, but I, I, I can't, I can't. I was so shocked to learn this and so disheartened. The Portuguese in Mozambique did not permit indigenous Mozambicans to go to school. So that means that your mamas, all those baby boomers, people around my age, Gen X, right? They were not allowed to go to school. Henceforth, they are functionally illiterate. So when you meet a person in Mozambique who's around about my age, middle age, chances are they are going to be functionally illiterate because they were not allowed to go to school. Y'all, it's 2024. The only people of African descent in Mozambique that were allowed an education, they were more than likely biracial, mulata, mulato, whatever they call it, half caste, whatever they call it there. They had a Portuguese parent. And even still, usually that education was segregated from Portuguese or European descent and that education was limited. So you were only allowed to go to school up until a certain age. Same thing happened in Namibia. Just a little sidetrack here. I was a teacher trainer in Namibia in the late 90s. Reason being because Namibians were colonized by South Africans. We all know about the apartheid in South Africa, which of course was enforced in Namibia. And so teachers, African teachers in Namibia were only allowed a 10th grade education. Because if I'm colonizing you, I'm only going to let you get so much information. You get too much information, you might get too haughty. You might forget your place. You might rise up. You'll educate the masses. And we're already a minority in this country. So I was there to... Uh, basically get the teacher's expertise up to a certain level so that they could then educate the masses and proceed forward into climbing within the global economy, etc. So back to Mozambique. If you were afforded the privilege, quote unquote, of an education as a person with African ancestry, they was only gonna let you get but so far. So the national literacy rate in Mozambique is 62%. However, there's a huge differential between the male literacy and the female literacy. The male literacy is at 60%, female is at 28%. This speaks to the level of patriarchy in the country. 40% of adults over the age of 15 cannot read and cannot write. Less than half of the population finishes primary school 
And those who do, only 8% of them go on to secondary school. This is based on a household survey from 2022. Roughly 40% of children between the ages of 6 and 17 are out of school, and only about 101,259 children have access to preschool education. From what I was told from a Mozambican is that they take education seriously and that education is relatively inexpensive there. So on their flag, they have a Marxist star, they have a hoe, as in an agricultural hoe, and they have a rifle and a book because even though their literacy rates are relatively low, they don't play about learning. And it was a joy for me to see kids walking home from school with their books, and there's such a pride to it. I mean, when you have that type of history, how can you not? versus how I grew up in the U.S. where it's like, let me see if I could finish my homework be before I have to go home so I don't have to carry these books because it was almost like shameful. You're, you weren't cool if you had books, if you had a book bag, if you were scholastic in any way. Now, from my research, which was rather cursory, I Googled just like everybody else, Mozambique only has one nationally owned commercial bank. Now, I met a brother who worked in the industry and he was like, we don't have any. We don't have any uh, nationally owned commercial banks. And I was like, that can't be true. Like, that can't be true. And he might be right. I found one called Mo's Bank. Hey, so you might say, well, who owns the banks in Mozambique? A group of shareholders, there's some Mozambican shareholders, but basically these banks are, are based outside of Mozambique, in Portugal, in South Africa, uh, in the UK. Like, a people who does not have control over their money. Yeah. So those are the facts, okay? Those are the facts. Now. Let me get into the pros first about Mozambique, and then I'll get into the cons. Let me start with the good stuff. The beaches are stunning. <laughs> I'm sorry, like, they got miles and miles upon miles of coastline. The beaches are beaching. Just gorgeous. Like, they have a coastline that has access to tremendous waves, amazing surfing, if that's what you're into. And then there's also parts of the coastline that are just tranquil. It, it was gorgeous. I'm going to try to add some photos here of my excursion. Just amazing stuff. It's a slower pace of life. And at this point in my life journey, I appreciate a slower pace of life. <laughs> Mozambique was pretty tasty. My understanding of Southern Africa, African cuisine is that compared to West Africa, y'all don't like comparisons, but I'm going to compare. Compared to West Africa, uh, the palate is a little bit more bland, you know, salt, pepper, black pepper, you know, that's pretty much it. However, because of the Portuguese influence, they had some cheesy dishes, um, and I felt like there was just a tad bit more flavor, and I really enjoyed the um, the meals that were infused with coconut milk and different spices and cheeses, it reminded me quite a bit of Afro-Brazilian cuisine. Obviously, you see that you see that connection. The people were really lo they loved visitors. The people were so lovely and welcoming and curious, and they legit enjoyed seeing a person of African descent in their country enjoying. I can say that I haven't had that experience everywhere. For instance, I was in Zimbabwe and there were Zimbabweans, black Zimbabweans that were serving me with anger and resentment. As in, you're black just like me, how are you worthy of this experience? That was not my experience in Mozambique. So I was happy for that. Um, I remember just going to like a real local, local spot for lunch 
And this woman was just like, where are you from? And she got her mother on the phone and I'm talking to her mom and people are just like, okay, like, yeah, I'll help you film, no problem. <laughs> it was a very welcoming experience for me. Mozambique is also wonderful because there are some shortcomings. However, they are so proximate to all of these Southern African nations. So, you know, if you love shopping, like, okay, I won't say I love shopping, but I like fashion. I found that Mozambique was lacking in that area, but you can take a bus. Like they have buses that go directly from Maputo to shopping malls in South Africa. So, you know, relatively close to South Africa, Lesotho, uh, Botswana, what's the other, Swaziland, Malawi. Hey, so, you know, you can take a train to these countries. The other thing that I really enjoy about Mozambique is their traditional architecture. I love architecture and I'm a fan of African traditional architecture. I know folks want their modern houses, concrete, cinder block, square, rectangular. <sighs> That's just not what I'm into. Look at the decor in my house. There is so much technology in our traditional architecture. And I think that sometimes in our quest to catch up and be more modern and to assimilate towards whiteness, we discard our ingenuity. And I just found the traditional architecture in Mozambique to be gorgeous. I'll try to share some pictures. Now, let me get into the cons, okay? We won't linger here, but I, I, I'm gonna be real and I'm gonna tell you. Difficulty of travel. Yeah, I know that a lot of Kenyans watch this show, listen to this podcast. And I know that every nation has its cons. Things that you just really want to change. My Kenyans. Be thankful. Just be thankful. Okay? So my plan was to start, you know, start in, in Maputo. Right? I flew into Joburg. From Joburg, you fly into Maputo, the capital, which is in the southernmost part of Mozambique. And then, uh, you know, take a bus to Tofu, then take a bus to Vilanclos, and then take a bus to Tete. I had a homeboy, strictly platonic, shout out to Angelo, that I had met in Zanzibar. He is uh, Portuguese. However, he has lots of ties to Mozambique. And... We met in Zanzibar because he used to manage one of the resorts near my house. And when he moved to Mozambique, he was he was always like, come through, come through, come through. And I was like, I most definitely will. When I got to Bilankunos, right, which is kind of central, like uh, Eastern, but central. Yeah. I was like, OK, now I can book my trip to Tete and go see the homie. And when I found out that there were no planes, right, that go directly to from to, from Vilanculos to Tete. I would have to fly back down to Maputo and then fly up to uh, Tete, which would have been an additional expense. I was like, I don't think I want to do that. Then I said, let's look in the buses. Let's, let's check out what the buses got going on. Then I found out that the buses take two days, two days of travel. I said, now, he's my friend, but I mean, why is it two days? So finally, somebody said, well, you know, there's no road that goes directly from here to there. And I was like, what do you mean? They were like, well, the road just runs out. So essentially, for a great portion of the trip, you're literally off-road and the, you're going into these deep crevices in the road. The bus is just like off-road and it's a rough trip and uh, it takes two days. So this woman was explaining to me that you board the bus in Bilanculos, 
you drive for 24 hours, you stop in a town, spend the night in that town, wake up, start the trip again, and that's the off-road part. And I really wanted to visit this friend. I really wanted to experience a different town. And I was on YouTube just really trying to get a feel of the town. And I was like, eh, I, I can't do it. We have a tattoos here in Kenya, really in all of East Africa, right? We have these bands that are really privately owned, however, publicly regulated to an extent. And we call them public transportation. It's basically, you know, you stuff a lot of people in there, you pay your money and it's, re it's relatively efficient. Then we have these gigantic buses that are, you know, painted artistically. There's Wi-Fi. There's surround sound, uh, music, you know, bumping. There's uh, TV screens with music videos. Like, it's a whole experience here in Kenya. Not so in Mozambique. The transportation, ho. Oh, in Maputo, the capital city, it's not bad. Like, there's no flavor. There's just no flavor there. You know, the, the Matatus, if you will, I forget what they call them there. They are not in good condition um, aesthetically or even mechanically. Uh, it's no flavor. They don't have the big buses like we have here or in Kampala. Once you get out of Maputo, that's when it's just, it's a gamble. You know, it's a gamble and it's not very efficient. It's, um, I just, I don't know what, what to say about that. Another con is that Maputo, really the whole country, but I tend to like look at the capital cities because the capital city is a good indication of what the country wants you to see how the country wants you to see it right it's like the facade the mask how do i want you to see me you can look to the capital cities generally speaking and it felt like it was stuck in time and i understand because their independent was independence was in 1975 so is the architecture in the capital city, all of that, the way the streets are organized, the sidewalks. Mind you, they have these gigantic sidewalks, but they're crumbling. And so after 1975, two years later, there was a civil war, like a, I mean, I don't know what, what is not catastrophic about a civil war, but it went on, I think until the 80s. So... The city, there was a lot of destruction in the city and it really has not come back. And you see it, you know, I was born in the 70s, so I know I remember that period and walking the streets of Maputo, it felt like I was stuck in the 70s. And I could see, it, I could see how the Portuguese was, they was living their best life. There's a lot of colorism. There's a lot of texturism in Mozambique a lot um most of the women that you will see in the capital city they will be skin brightening they will be in some process of skin lightening skin brightening and they will have stiff wigs lace fronts when I went to the market in Maputo that everybody said that you should go to there's a whole section aisle after aisle after aisle of people making weaves and wigs and selling all of these hair products and just like whereas before it was like a food a fruit market now there's this whole section that's dedicated to hair and the Chinese are there by the way so one of the things that struck me is that throughout Africa when you see a hair salon or a beauty salon, there is imagery of melanated people on the, fr on the fronts of these buildings, on the facades, that 
indicate like this is what you're gonna look like once you once you step out of our salon. This is what we promise. We promise we can turn you into this, right? That is the marketing. Albeit most of the people on the fronts of these salons and beauty shops, barbershops, they're light skinned. They're usually African American celebrities, etc. They're much lighter than the uh, the local populace. That's a problem. However, in Mozambique, the marketing, the facade, the fronts of these buildings is plastered with white people. So that is the ideal. The ideal is to aspire to whiteness, whereas in most parts of Africa, the ideal is to aspire to uh, biracialness, mulattoness. So there's, there's degrees of colorism and in Mozambique, it's really high. So for me, as somebody who's a human rights lawyer, for someone who is really tuned into these types of things, also a sociologist, I was like, oh, okay. I, it was very disturbing for me, to be honest with you. Another kind is the men in Mozambique are a trip. I'm a single heterosexual woman. So, and I was traveling solo. My encounters with men were real interesting. I always say, once you mix that African with that Latin, baby, <laughs> from Brazilians to Dominicans to Puerto Ricans to Mozambicans, like across the board. Hey, I found them to be possessive, controlling, lots of machismo. I mean, yeah. So I ended up meeting this guy. Again, transportation. So let me go back to the, the trend because the transportation is interwoven into this. So I went to this restaurant. It was a seafood restaurant in Maputo. Everybody was raving about it. It was supposed to be like the nicest restaurant there. I was like, okay, let me go check it out. It was all right, you know, it was okay. And when I got ready to leave, I couldn't get a car back. Now, Uber's not there, boat is not there, but they do have uh, a couple of local ride sharing apps that I was using. I was unable to get a car. So I said, you know what? I'm just gonna walk until I can maybe get a Matatu. And that's what I did. Got on a Matatu, I was like, okay, I don't know where I'm going, it's dark. So I was just asking people in the Matatus, anybody speak English? Cause I was using my Spanish, but my Spanish was only getting me but so far. Because, you know, the pronunciation is different, although the spelling might be the same between Spanish and Portuguese. Okay. So this guy turns around and he's like, you know, I speak English. I can help where you're going. I told him where I'm going. He was like, cool. I'm getting off at the same stop. I was like, all right, cool. So we chatted up, chatted up. We get off and I'm just literally down the road from where I'm staying. I had an Airbnb be really cool. And he was like, I'm going to an all-female hip-hop event. Would you like to go? I'm like, yeah, of course I want to go, you know, <laughs> of course. So I'm like, this is how my life unfolds, adventure. And, you know, we walk and we talk and, and it's just like, you know, two people just enjoying time and space. The moment, <laughs> first of all, did not pay for him to get in? I think I did. Some some was going on with his money, his whatever. I don't know. I was just like, look, I'll just pay. And it wasn't cheap to get up in there. So I paid for him to get up in there. And as soon as we got up in there, he puts his arm around my shoulder. I was like, what are you doing? Don't, don't do that. Claiming me, as my girlfriend would say, he's pissing all over you. He is claiming his territory. You are his property. And I was like, I don't do that. So he did it a second time. And I was just like, what, what are you? <laughs> Good sir. The, the scene, the hip hop concert, all women. That's what's up. It was a good time. So me and this guy, we stay in contact and um, we end up, I end up meeting him at a cafe. As soon as he left, because he had to go back to work, as soon as he left, 
men started coming over to my table. <laughs> men that had seen him talking to me, they started coming over to my table and they were just like, yeah, you know, really aggressive. Like, and basically they were like, I'm the better choice. You know, what are you doing with, with him? I, I'm the better choice. Like I was just like, no, nah, I'm much. Ultimately, the guy that I met on the Matatu became really possessive. Like, I, I, I told him, I said, listen, I can't do this. And I find you to be very controlling. And I know that I'm not the first person to tell you this. And he was like, yeah, I, you know, basically I have been told that. However, you know, I really want to stay in contact with you. And when we were at the concert, one of his homies was like, this the one, this the one, this the one. And I'm like, How? I just showed up. How am I the like they was really bigging him up and just like inflating his head. It was interesting. Uh there's no real fashion scene. That's not to say that there's not fashion designers. I would just say that the people who are designing, they're mostly creating wedding wear. And it makes sense because if the economy is depressed, people are really not buying clothes like that except for secondhand, because they obviously they have a secondhand market. However, it, when people buy new, it's basically just during special occasions. So they, these designers there, they're creating more so wedding dresses. And I did find one line that was kind of appealing. However, I could see that they were not marketing to black Mozambicans. Their models for the most part were Portuguese looking, perhaps Indian looking. I couldn't really tell. They were like European looking with a slight tan. And the couple of models that they used in their lookbooks uh, that were African, black African, they were like in the background. And I could obviously see that they were not marketing to me. So um, I didn't want to support that. And when I was speaking to another creative about this particular brand, she agreed. She was like, yeah, they don't. They don't want to fuck with us. Like that ought to give you an indication of where they are at socially. The other issue, I had difficulty accessing my money. It wasn't as difficult as Nigeria. If you haven't watched that video, how Nigeria made me appreciate Kenya, watch it. It wasn't as difficult as Nigeria, but it was still difficult. And I think it might just be because they're on an entirely different banking system because they were colonized by the Portuguese and the Portuguese still own the majority of their banks. There was one woman that was staying across from me. I forget what country in Europe she was from, but she couldn't get access her money at all. Imagine being on vacation and you can't even use your ATM card, honey. Woo! So what I would say is it was commonplace for the ATMs to be out of money. I was uncomfortable using the ATMs because many times there wasn't like an enclosure. You're just literally on the street. And I'm a city girl, so I'm just like, you know, hyper paranoid. You know what I'm saying? You're literally on the street. There's no security guard. And you're just using this ATM machine in some cases, not all. Um, I got a SIM card. That was easy. They have an Impesa system attached to these SIM cards, very much like, you know, Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania. However, I was having difficulty accessing that piece. The Mpesa is like a mobile wallet. So I got up one morning, went directly to, I believe it was Airtel. And I was literally there for the whole day trying to get this situation worked out. Now this was last year, so I don't remember the specifics. And then it's very commonplace to see these long lines of people trying to get access to their money at ATM machines. So when I was in Vilaculos, I was like, oh, and Vilaculos is a town, it's a coastal town in Mozambique, long lines of people. So I'm in the, I'm in the line, I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna be patient. Then I see this brother rolls up, you know, he's got, you know, a, a suit and tie on and he forms his own line, the classism. Then this other woman rolls up. She looks East Indian-ish. Uh, and then another woman rolls up and she's European and they form their own line directly opposite us. So I'm like, what is going on? There's a security guard there. 
And the security guard is letting them people go before all of us who have been waiting in this line to access the ATM machine. I think I waited a, about 45 minutes that time just to access the ATM machine. And, you know, there's a limit on how much money that you can withdraw. The limit is not as low as it was in Nigeria, but it's it's pretty low. <sighs> that was that was a major challenge. When I was in Tofu, which is another beach town, coastal beach town in Mozambique, there were no ATM machines in that town. And, you know, Mozambique is largely a cash economy. So uh, there's really no using your credit card or debit card in most places. Like, there's really not a lot of that. So what I had to do is go to the main road and, like, I wanted to get a Matatu. The Matatu would stop and I was just like, where am I? I couldn't figure out how I was supposed to get inside because it was packed. Like people were standing up, people's asses was hanging out the window. Like they were just like, come on, come on. And I was like, where? And they would just drive off and leave me. So I Googled, I was like, well, how far is it? Maybe I'll just walk. <laughs> I ended up hitchhiking a ride in a pickup truck. I did this a couple of times, okay? I ended up hitchhiking a ride in, a, in the back of a pickup truck to the next two towns over to the gas station that had a few shops and an ATM machine. And that's how I was able to get cash out. And then, well, I think I walked back to Tofu and because uh, they have Tofu, Tofino, and then there's another town where the ATM was. And I did that a couple of times. Yo. But what I can say is that my stay in Tofu was just magical. I had a cottage on top of this hill and I could look out to the ocean, even though the ocean wasn't right there, it was a ways away but I could still see the ocean. I could see whales. Oh my God, it was so... Oh, mm. My trip highlights tofu. <laughs> I met an American woman, an Asian American woman in tofu who was raising her son there. She had a bakery. It was a pop-up bakery. It was only open two days out the week. Her pastries was so good. Like it was cracking it. I wanted to extend my trip just so I could be there the next round when she opened up to get these. Oh my God, they were so good. Tofu was the highlight, beautiful, peaceful, picturesque, good food. It's just small town vibes. Um, the hip hop concert. <sighs> to, to know that my culture, hip hop, you know, I represent the first generation of hip hop to know that it had made it all the way to Mozambique and them sisters was flowing. It was one sister from Botswana. You know what I'll do? I will put a link to the Instagram post where I feature those ladies, A. Hey. Um, one, the, the fashion scene wasn't really there. However, how and so ever, what I really enjoyed was being able to purchase denim on the street and have it tailored in real time. So I was able to like go down to this area in my puto and there were just street vendors, mounds and mounds and mounds of denim. And I love denim, like a full head to toe denim look, love it. You pick, <laughs> you pick out something that you're interested in or you show them a picture of what you want. And I really wanted this patchwork denim. And then they go and they just pull from different people. You literally try this stuff on, on the street so it, it helps to wear a skirt. <laughs> and then like if it fits for me, if it fit me in my thighs, in my booty, then right there next to the clothing vendor was a line of tailors outside. And they measure you and you just wait under a tree while they, you know, really like, taper the waist and you know him whatever needs to be done that to me was really fun the low lights i had really i was looking forward to having a really wonderful photo shoot on the beach 
in the long course. I had went on Pinterest and just figured out how I wanted to look, what I wanted to give. And the goal was like, showcase the environment and I'm just a small, I'm just a small piece of it, but just showcase the environment. And I hired this photographer who was supposed to be the best Milankunos had. The nigga showed up late. I wanted it to be a sunrise session. You get the sun rising, the ocean, the niggas showed up late. The sun had already risen. And what really pissed me off is that he was able to get images of himself with the sun rising in the background, but there were none of me with the sun in the background. It was just gray. It was overcast. Then he tried to do some doctoring that didn't make sense. And I, I paid him. And he was supposed to be the best they had. The difficulty of travel, I covered that. Bearing witness to the caste system. The caste system in Mozambique is real. You know what I'm saying? You got the Portuguese up here. I would imagine, you know, the Indians is right below them. Then you got uh, the, the mulattoes there. And then you got everybody else. And as a sociologist, it was um, easy to see and it was difficult to witness. Should you move to Mozambique? It depends on what you're looking for. What are you looking for? Are you interested in living off grid? Are you interested in uh, agriculture? Um, are you interested in technology? Because they could use a lot of that. It really depends on what you, what are your top five non-negotiables and what does that country have to offer? If you are looking to escape an apartheid system. Mozambique probably will not be for you. There is uh, a racial strata in Mozambique, and I experienced that. Even in dealing with white Americans in Mozambique, I happened to meet them in Tofu, and I don't want to get into the specifics because it was very violent. It was emotionally violent. I will just say that these white Americans that I met they weren't trying to see me, but yet they were intrigued by me. And so ultimately they ended up treating me kind of like a novelty pet, like a novel pet. And then they tried to pimp me out to this European dude who was married, who had a fetish for black women. And it was under the guise of, come, let's hang out, come hang out with us. <sighs> I won't get into the details. So when you're moving to a new place, you have to ask yourself, who's going to be a part of my social circle? And the fact that you more than likely, you might have a college education and you're exposed to this and that, and then you're moving to a country where the literacy, illiteracy rate is very high, who are you going to talk to? Who will you experience life with? And how will you all experience life together? Uh, before I forget, I do offer Blacksit consultations. If you're interested in Blacksiting to Africa specifically, hit me up. There's a link in the description. All right. Um, so your social circle is going to depend on who you are and what you value. Now, when I was in Zanzibar, I tried making friends with people in my neighborhood. It was a sister down the street from me. She kept inviting me to go out with her. I went out with her. First of all, I just want to say she showed up to go out. Her face was powdered white. Again, this desire to be more proximate to whiteness, to Arabness. Hey. Secondly, she expected me to buy all her drinks. And I was like, I'm not your man. You need to get these dudes you talking to all up in their face. Get one of them to buy you a drink. So there's that piece, right? The economic piece. Then, you know, I was also um, developed a rapport, so a friendship really, um, with the woman who lived across from me. I lived in a small fishing village. And we developed a friendship through our food. I would cook, send her some food over. She would cook, have, she would have me come over. And then we would go like hunting for food together in the ocean during low tide. 
So that, but that was the extent of our friendship because there was a language barrier, right? She did, she didn't speak no English and my key Swahili was like this. So that's something for you to consider. I hope <laughs> that I gave you um, enough information about Mozambique. Please do your own research and that's it for now. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Blacks into Africa. If you liked what you heard, please share, subscribe, and leave a comment. May you thrive. May you be inspired. May you move with love and intention. Until next time. Oh,